Here I'll go over some basic neural anatomy and physiology as it pertains to neuraxial anesthetics. I've drawn here a spinal cord. And we'll talk about the sympathetic and the somatic afferents and efferents that will be blocked by a neuraxial technique. Um, obviously you have both sympathetic and somatic leaving from both the left hand and the right hand side of a real spinal cord, but they're separated here just so this diagram doesn't get too crowded. So we'll start by talking about the sympathetics. Your sympathetic nervous system is a branch of your autonomic nervous system, and you have various sympathetic ganglia that send and receive information to and from various nerve roots. The cervical ganglia, there's actually three of them, the superior, middle, and inferior, but they will transmit their information through nerve roots T1 to T4. This diagram could be a little bit more clear because it sort of looks like all of these different types of ganglia are all entering in at this one level, but in reality, this cervical ganglia will only enter nerve roots T1 through 4. The celiac ganglion will enter nerve roots T5 to T12. And your inferior mesenteric ganglion will enter at nerve roots L1 to L3. So by blocking different nerve root levels, you'll see sympathetic effects in the distribution of any of these particular sympathetic ganglion. Importantly, the cervical ganglia carry sympathetic information to and from your heart. This is crucial for the beta adrenergic tone to have an elevated heart rate and contractility. By having a sympathetic neuraxial block at T1 to T4, you are blocking these efferents that are destined to control this sympathetic tone at your cervical ganglia. And while you're at it, you're also blocking all of the sympathetic afferents at the same time. The cervical ganglia also carry sympathetics to and from the lungs. And technically there are some alpha receptors that will bronchoconstrict, but the more significant sympathetic effect for the lungs is beta-2 causing bronchodilation, which is why extreme vagal tone or lack of sympathetic stimulation can sometimes be associated with bronchoconstriction. Although bronchoconstriction does not tend to be a result of your sympathetic block and the effects on the lungs are overall quite mild. You also have blood vessels. The celiac ganglion, again, which enters in through T5 to T12, carries information to and from your GI tract, the liver, adrenal glands, and abdominal and splanchnic blood vessels. Finally, the most relevant part of our inferior mesenteric ganglion is bladder. And these sympathetics enter in through L1 to L3. What we're doing with our neuraxial technique is blocking these nerve roots so both the afferent and the efferent fibers of your sympathetic nervous system are going to be blocked. And your sympathetic nervous system happens to be the easiest thing to block with neuraxial or local anesthetics in general. So what happens when we block the nerve roots associated with any of these particular sympathetic ganglia? Basically, we end up with unopposed vagal tone to those locations. You will lose your sympathetic tone and be left only with the parasympathetic tone. So for your heart, 
that means bradycardia and hypotension akin to fainting or having a vagal, vasovagal episode. The effects on the lungs are actually quite minimal. In theory, you could get bronchoconstriction, although even in patients with asthma, neuraxial techniques are not contraindicated, which gives you an idea of how unlikely you are to see issues with that. When you block the sympathetic tone to your blood vessels, you get vasodilation and hypotension. This is both from a decrease of your systemic vascular resistance from the arterial tone and decrease of your preload from venous vasodilation. For your GI tract, the dominant parasympathetic tone is associated with increased peristalsis or decreased ileus. And by blocking sympathetics to and from the adrenal gland, you're going to be decreasing the neuroendocrine stress response. In general, this decreased neuroendocrine stress response is also just from a overall decreased pain experience because of the analgesia control with your neuraxial technique, but certainly also has something to do with the sympathetic flow to and from your adrenal glands. There are a lot of blood vessels in your abdominal and splanchnic vasculature, so obviously if you were to block this, you'll also get hypotension which is decrease SVR and decrease preload. In case it's not clear, let me show you this parasympathetic nervous system here, which has craniosacral outflow, which means that the only place that your parasympathetic nervous system enters your spinal cord is through the cranial nerves, namely the vagus nerve way up here and down in the sacral nerve roots so coming out here these sacral nerve roots are relevant because they go to the bladder and this parasympathetic tone is responsible for bladder tone and the voiding reflex so a neuraxial block often will extend down into the sacrum, so you will get blockade of this part of your parasympathetic nervous system, and that results in urinary retention, which is why patients need a Foley catheter while they're actively receiving a neuraxial block and should be monitored for urinary retention as the block wears off. Then everything else in the middle, so your heart, your lungs, your GI tract, etc., receives its parasympathetic innervation all from the vagus nerve, which you will not block with a neuraxial technique. Unless your spinal is so extremely high that it reaches way up to your cranial nerves, you will not get parasympathetic vagal blockade. On the other hand, with your sympathetic nervous system, which is thoracolumbar outflow, meaning that the sympathetic nervous system enters the spinal cord through these nerve roots from T1 to L3. I'll just draw some nerve roots entering into the spinal cord. We don't have to do them all, but right down to L3 is where the sympathetic nervous system will enter your spinal cord. When you're blocking these nerve roots, which is what you do with the neuraxial technique, that's right in the range of where your entire sympathetic nervous system lies. And what happens to these sympathetic fibers as they leave your nerve roots is that they wrap around and form this sympathetic chain which lays beside your vertebral bodies. That will run all the way up and down your spinal column. But this sympathetic chain is outside of the vertebral canal, so you're not blocking the nerves along this sympathetic chain, you're actually blocking them as they leave the spinal cord at the nerve roots. For example, your superior cervical ganglia actually resides way up here, near your cervical vertebrae, but the nerve fibers travel down 
and then enter the spinal cord through T4 or T1 to T4. That about covers uh, the blockade of the sympathetic nervous system. I should just add that these afferents are C fibers and these efferents are B fibers.